Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Joey Betts, and um, I'm going to talk briefly about research that I did this summer uh, with Professor Brian Dupont. And our focus was on creating an expand microwave accelerating cavity um, here at the University of Maryland. Um, so a little bit of background of what I'm talking about and what I actually worked on this summer. Um, so an accelerator can be thought of um, as just two metal plates um, with an induced electric field between them. And when you have charged particles coming in at, in a beam um, and they enter this electric field, they'll experience a force um, which will actually accelerate them, increasing their velocity. Um, and so what our cavities are doing is taking an input signal um, from a waveguide and this is coming in at microwave frequency, which is switching the direction of the electric field. That way, um, you're continuously accelerating all of the clumps of uh, particles that are coming in your beam. Um, so the purpose of the project that I was actually working on this summer was to design and manufacture a cavity at the University of Maryland. Cavities like this have been built before um, at universities like Stanford and Cornell. Um, Stanford actually has done the most work on this um, with their Slack uh, uh, accelerator laboratory. Um, so the design for my cavity, um, it should be uh, working in the X-band frequency range, which is between 8 to 12 gigahertz. Um, the resonance modes for the cavities um, were first calculated analytically, so using, uh, doing it by hand and then comparing that with uh, simulated results. Um, on software that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, once I had good agreement between the methods, uh, the calculating the resonance modes by hand and the simulation, I actually moved forward and started uh, redesigning the cavity. Um, so the analytic methods I used, uh, first I used an LC lump circuit um, analogy, which is basically treating a resonant cavity as a capacitor and an inductor, and um, this circuit will just resonate and you can find the fundamental frequency for this. Um, secondly, I solved Maxwell's equations for a cylindrical cavity um, with vessel functions. Um, so this is finding like the true uh, resonance of the structure. And then the last analytic method that I tried was this Valium black formula. Um, but you can see that the LC and the Valium black formula both gave uh, really large percent differences when compared to the simu simulated results. Um, so we're assuming that this is true, like it sh the program should be working correctly. It's just that we want some way of validating it by hand. Um, so that's why we solved Maxwell's equations and then tested it um, with the simulation. All right, so once I had a good um, comparison between the analytic methods and my simulated results, I moved into redesigning the cavity. Um, so what I went with was a simple re-entry cavity design, uh, which looks exactly like this. Um, and then I created a model in ANSYS, um, which is a high-frequency uh, structure simulator. Um, and then I tested it using their eigenmode simulation and driven modal simulation. So eigenmode is used to find the resonance frequency of a structure, and driven modal, you're actually um, sending in power to the structure and seeing how the fields change in time, which is really useful when you're designing a cavity that's gonna have cha a changing electric field inside of it. Um, so I had to go through several uh, versions of the model before I finally found something that was good enough to actually move forward to fabricate. Um, so here you can see um, my copy was meant to be operated in the TMO2 mode, which means transverse magnetic, um, and it's the second transverse magnetic mode. So, this is looking um, down at the cavity if you cut it and then you're looking at a cross section. So TMO1, you can see that the vector E field is all pointed in the same direction and the peak field strength is in the middle, which would be where the beam tube comes into the cavity. Um, in TMO2, you actually have the E field switches direction on the outer edges at larger radius, um, but the peak field strength is still along the beam tube and it's in um, one direction, which is what you want for acceleration. So the frequency of operation uh, that I found for the cavity I designed in simulation was 12.713 gigahertz, which is just above X-band, but it was still uh, low enough that we could actually do network analysis um, with the network analyzer that I had in my lab. 
Um, so here's another picture of simulation. Uh, this is just showing the electric field uh, vector. So you can see in the, the top and the bottom here, the field is actually pointed to the left, and it's much weaker than in the middle where it's directed to the right, and it's the maximum field strength. And this is what the model looked like in, uh, on the computer. Um, so once, we, once I was happy with uh, how the model acted in the simulation, uh, I went ahead and I actually created a 3D printed model, which I have here today, um, which you can see that it has that uh, cavity shape, which I designed on the computer. Um, and then this was actually really useful uh, when I was going to the machine shop and trying to figure out how to actually cut this shape out of metal, which no one had done before here. Um, so what I used these for a lot was checking to make sure that the tools would actually clear the cavity um, so I didn't break the CNC lathe um, or the mill. Um, so then below in this picture is the aluminum cavity that I, that I actually manufactured here in Ivory. Um, so I used the CNC lathe to cut the cavity shape and then I used the mill to drill all of these holes for the mounting hardware. Um, so here is a picture of our CNC lathe in Ivory, and then this is a picture of the programming screen um, because there's no function, yeah, believe it or not, there's no function preloaded to cut a re-entry cavity design on our, on our CNC lathe. So I had to program it myself, which was very time consuming. Um, I didn't expect that to be like one of the hardest parts of the project. Um, so testing, um, I found that the resonant frequency of the model that I actually manufactured was uh, slightly higher than in simulation, um, and the Q value was also much less, which is expected because in simulation I was using a copper cavity. Um, this is from the bead hole um, testing that I did, which I can explain that later if you have more questions. Um, you can come on my poster. Um, and then, so for my conclusion, um, the resonant frequency was shifted, um, and uh, there needs to be better coupling between the waveguide and the cavity itself.